Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the dog, and we're going to talk about the endocrine system. But before we do that, as I do with all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me great images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start at the front of the dog, and we're going to start with the pituitary gland. And one of the well-known diseases of the pituitary gland happens often in German Shepherds and German Shepherd mixes. And this is called pituitary dwarfism. It is an autosomal recessive molecular defect resulting in deficiency in the LHX3 gene of the dog and prevents proper development of the glandular portion of the pituitary gland where many of the major endocrine hormones are created. Now, when we look at these dogs, they have significant defects or differences from their litter mates. Here are two litter mates. You can see one is maturing into a nice German Shepherd dog. The other one is much smaller. It has a poor hair coat. It has sort of a foxy appearance. It's about a quarter the size. And you see a lot of problems with these dogs as a result in deficiencies of thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, gonadotropins, prolactin, and adrenocorticotropic hormones all of which were, are produced in the pars glandularis of the pituitary gland. This poor animal doesn't even have hardly any hair coat at all. Generally, their maturation is delayed, their physes close late, they often have puppy dentition, and even worse, their thyroid glands and their adrenal glands are very hypoplastic because they have never, even in uh, fetal development, had the stimulation to grow to become the normal glands. So these animals, especially with these hypoplastic adrenal glands, they tend to be Addisonian, they do not do well under times of stress, and they have markedly shorter lifespans. And here's what one of those pituitary glands will look like. They appear cystic. Now, the lack of formation of the pars glandularis, also known as the pars distalis, is associated with failure of differentiation of the oropharyngeal ectoderm of Rathke's pouch. And it gives you this cystic appearance to the pituitary gland. Don't confuse this with a non-clinical defect which also results in cystic change in the pituitary gland and these are cysts of the distal cranial pharyngeal duct. They're very common. You can see them in about 50 percent of dogs and they're just small cysts within the pituitary. Grossly, you could confuse the two. But cysts of the cranial pharyngeal duct don't do anything. It is that failure of differentiation of the oropharyngeal ectoderm, which gives rise to the tremendous constellation of defects associated with defective formation of the pars glandularis. Here's another great picture of what one of these defective glandular parts of the pituitary will look like. You just have these large cysts where that hormone-making cells should live. When you look at these particular animals on autopsy, you're going to see very small, shriveled thyroids. Uh, you'll see parathyroid glands, but there's not much more to them. The adrenal glands will be extremely small. If you can find them, they're going to have a very thin cortex. We're going to talk a little bit about adrenal glands later on. Now, far more common in the dog are neoplasms of the pituitary gland. Okay, neoplasms of the pituitary gland result in pituitary-dependent hypercortisolism or Cushing's disease, and about 80% of cases of spontaneous Cushing disease in the dog are the result of a pituitary 
adenoma that is secreting excessive adrenocotropic hormone. When we look at uh, uh, pituitary tumors in the dog, adenomas are much more common than carcinomas. Um, grossly, the things that you're going to look for are size and invasion. I would probably call this a pituitary adenoma. Pituitary adenomas uh, are generally smaller. They don't result in CNS signs, whereas the carcinomas, which are larger and push upwards into the hypothalamus, will. And adenomas can even be microscopic. We call those micro adenomas. When we look at the spectrum of hormones that neoplastic adenomas of the pituitary gland will make, uh, too much adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, is by far the most common, resulting in Cushing's disease. There are a couple of other uh, hormones that the pituitary secretes, including growth hormone, which is rare. We're going to look at that in just a minute. And then there is no reports of it producing, a pituitary tumors producing too much thyroid stimulating hormone and result in hyperthyroidism. So when you see a tumor, usually going to be causing Cushing's disease. And here's an absolutely fantastic picture of a pituitary adenoma and the changes that they usually incite in the adrenal glands. This pituitary gland is producing too much ACTH and its result on the adrenal glands is going to be profound hyperplasia of the adrenal cortex. Now when you cut an adrenal gland lengthwise, the ratio of the cortex to the medulla to the cortex on the other side should be about one to one to one. Here it's probably about five to one to five. And this shows that the adrenal gland cortex is markedly hyperplastic. It is going to produce way too much cortisol and the animal will develop Cushing's disease. This syndrome is known as pituitary associated Cushing's disease and is about 80% of all of the cases of spontaneous Cushing disease in dogs. When we get to the adrenal glands, we'll see that the other 20% are usually caused by functional neoplasms of the adrenal cortex have nothing to do with the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland in those dogs is going to be absolutely normal. It also gives you a good idea if the animal has a malignancy of the pituitary gland of the structures that will be affected as the pituitary gland grows larger. It can press on a number of of structures in this area resulting in neurologic signs. It can press upwards on the optic chiasm resulting in blindness. It can press upward on the structures of the hypothalamus resulting in diabetes insipidus and pituitary cachexia. Most diagnoses of Cushing's disease are clinical in nature, a combination of clinical pathologic data, and perhaps imaging. Um, when we look at the pituitary gland, there are a number of stains that we can do, that we can put on a pituitary gland at, at autopsy that will help with this diagnosis. Probably the two best are MSH and ACTH. Clinical signs that you will see in affected dog are Generally, over time, the animal will develop significant cutaneous changes. You will have bilaterally symmetrical hair loss, especially starting over the neck and the back. There will be a thinning of the skin, and uh, the skin will start to turn red and become mineralized as a result of development of calcinosis cutis. And the cause of calcinosis cutis isn't that well known, but it's theorized that 
over time the high levels of steroids will cause a change in the collagen of the skin which predisposes it to dystrophic calcification. Of course these animals will show other signs uh, which could be polyuria, polydipsia. There's a, a constellation of clinical signs associated with it. Don't forget about the, uh, the thrombotic nature of these particular animals as steroids uh, inhibit tissue plasminogen activators and, and many more signs associated with these animals. Well, Here's sort of a sad, sleepy-looking animal with its litter mates. And I mentioned that uh, one of the other hormones that may be liberated by tumors of the pituitary would be growth hormone, resulting in acromegaly. Acromegaly has some pretty profound cutaneous and musculoskeletal clinical signs associated with it and you see excessive soft tissue of the face as well as of the tissues of the mouth they tend to expand and you can see that there are prominent spaces in the uh, uh, between these incisors and increased interdental uh, space with some gingival proliferation and you will see because of this sort of enlargement of the uh, tissues of the face and of the mouth, a inspiratory strider. Um, you see a similar thing in cats, and they also, cats tend to get an increase in the size of the paws, but the, uh, the change in the mouth is, uh, is extremely striking in cats. It's also a condition that we see in uh, excessive levels of growth hormone in people as well acromegaly. Okay, let's leave the pituitary gland and let's move a little farther down the animal's body and we're going to move to the thyroid gland. And there's a couple of significant problems that we see with the thyroid gland in dogs. One of the most common are neoplasms of the thyroid gland. And unfortunately for, for dogs as opposed to cats, about 90 to 95 percent of thyroid tumors in the dog are malignant. Now, these animals, about 60% are going to be euthyroid, and I bet that was the case in this dog because the, the contralateral thyroid gland is uh, the normal size and color, so I don't think there was any, uh, any high levels of, of thyroid glands. About 20% of these animals will be hyperthyroid about 20% of these animals will be hypothyroid, but the majority of them are euthyroid. Now, 99 to 95% of these are going to be carcinomas. Generally, if you can palpate the thyroid in a dog, you're almost always dealing with a malignant neoplasm. They're easily palpable, and there have been a number of papers that have been published over the years that have positively correlated the size uh, measured in the area of, of uh, thyroid tumors with potential malignancy. Um, this one doesn't look fairly, doesn't look very infiltrative. It looks like it's hanging on by the normal fibrous connective tissue. It looks like it's uh, uh, pretty encapsulated, but this is unusual. And most of the neoplasms that we see in the thyroid gland tend to be very invasive. They tend to be firmly attached to the underlying tissue. They will infiltrate skeletal muscle, maybe even into the wall of the trachea. And the other thing that they will do is they will commonly metastasize and very widely by infiltration of the cranial and caudal thyroid veins. And here are those veins. And they these, in this particular case, are absolutely full of neoplastic cells. Thyroid carcinomas at diagnosis, studies have shown anywhere, this is a wide range, from 15% to 60% already have metastasized. And that goes up to 80% 
show metastases at autopsies. We see them commonly in older dogs. And these thyroid carcinomas, you will see all over the body. Um, they metastasize. Here's, a, here's an animal with metastatic thyroid carcinoma. They may uh, metastasize through the vessels to the base of the heart, or they may decide to go all over the body. Thyroid carcinomas can be very, very aggressive. Another condition which affects the thyroid gland of the dog is hypothyroidism due to atrophy of the thyroid gland. Now this can be a tricky slide because you don't know, are these parathyroids too big? Could this animal have chronic renal failure? Or are the thyroids too small? And this one is not too difficult to figure out because when you look at the thyroid gland that we saw in that other picture, it has a very nice brick red appearance because like all endocrine organs it is heavily invested with blood vessels that's what you have to do if you're secreting a lot of hormones they have to get into the blood and go all over the body okay unfortunately these thyroids are sort of grayish they have some large follicles and they are much smaller than normal just for fun here's a little cyst here's one here that you often see at the uh, junction of the thyroid and the parathyroid gland where during development um, the pharyngeal pouches three and four tend to touch each other and often you're left with these little cysts they don't mean anything these are called uh, kersteiner's cysts and you always see them at the junction of the thyroid and the parathyroid gland in most cases of hypothyroidism in the dog about 65 to 80 percent are due to immune mediated causes and sectioning of these thyroid glands and we go back to this one where we can still see the gland you will see lymphocytic thyroiditis in breeds that are especially affected with immune mediated lymphoid uh, lymphoid thyroiditis um, this condition starts extremely young uh, can even be within the first two to four months of life the process starts and we see this in a number of species including Dobermans Great Danes poodles iris setters um, a number of terriers including Airedales Shetland sheepdogs and something called a Hova wart, which I'm not very familiar with. It's a European type of dog, which has a high incidence of this. The condition starts very early in the dog's life at four months. And by two years of age, the thyroid glands are reduced to almost nothing. Okay, we're looking at the parathyroid glands here. And this is where the thyroid gland used to be. But all we see now histologically is probably going to be uh, a couple of residual large follicles and a lot of lymphocytes. Something that's very interesting about this particular condition in the dog is that after this immune-mediated attack, you don't see much fibrosis. They, the follicles just sort of, of disappear. And if you don't see the inflammation, you're wondering, hey, where did the thyroid go? Um, usually the process has come almost to a conclusion before you start to see a decrease in thyroid hormones. About 75 to 85 percent of the thyroid gland is gone before the thyroid hormones dip at all. This is probably because the remaining thyroid follicles become hyperfunctional. In the first two years of this animal's life, measuring thyroid hormones is not going to give you a diagnosis. What will is a sensitive assay that's available now for thyroglobulin autoantibodies. Because of this inflammation, the animal will develop antibodies against the liberated thyroglobulin out of these destroyed follicles and that's how 
most of these diagnoses are made early in the life of these animals. Good news is, although they tend to be sort of these uh, sleepy, cold dogs, often with a poor hair coat and what has been referred to as the tragic face or the sad face of hypothyroidism, thyroid replacement is available for these animals and the parathyroid glands are not attacked. Here's one other little factoid that I don't want to leave this discussion of the thyroid gland without giving to you because I think it's incredibly cool. So what do you do with these gigantic thyroid tumors, or at least in people where they don't tend to metastasize very much? You can't just cut it off because you need your parathyroid glands. Well, in people, what they do with people who have thyroid follicular carcinomas is they dissect in and they remove the parathyroid gland and they surgically embed it in the muscles of your forearm and put a little tattoo over it so they always know where it's going to be. And even though the blood supply has been disrupted, in six to eight weeks it will develop its own blood supply within your forearm and then you'll have functioning parathyroid glands again. And I guess that's an option uh, for cats in which uh, bilateral thyroid ectomy may be contemplated. Okay. Let's move a little farther back and we'll hit the pancreas. Not a whole lot of pathology of the pancreas in the dog, but one thing that we do want to mention are neoplasms of the islets or islet cell carcinoma in the dog. As opposed to the ferret, one of my favorite species in which islet cell tumors are very common, usually act in a benign way. Unfortunately, both dogs and cats, they tend to be very bad news. Okay, dogs and cats often will have a lot of age-related changes in the exocrine pancreas, but these tumors of the islet cells tend to metastasize widely even before the animal is diagnosed with elevated levels of insulin, which result in hypoglycemia and neurologic change. So by the time this animal shows the first sign of hypoglycemia, this particular neoplasm usually has metastasized to regional lymph nodes, maybe to the liver. And so islet cell tumors in the dog is what we call a small bag disease. If you never heard that term, that means you go out and you buy a small bag of dog food because unfortunately the average lifespan is fairly short in these animals. One thing that's really nice about this great picture from Paul Stromberg is it shows you that how neoplasms tend to recapitulate the tissue of origin. We've talked about endocrine tissues generally being sort of reddish brown because of the vascularity. Same thing happens with this tumor as well. Okay, let's move on to the adrenal glands. Um, now, some pathologists like Dr. Donald Mutin, who's taught me almost everything I know about endocrine pathology, could probably do a three-hour lecture just on the adrenal glands, but uh, or ten hours on endocrine glands. I'm, I try to keep it uh, very basic. I leave a lot of the clin path to the clinical pathologists who can keep it straight a lot better than I can. But remember what we said when we examined this great picture of an adrenal gland. Remember what we said about the size on the longitudinal section of the adrenal gland. The cortex should be approximately one, the medulla should be one, and the other side should be one. So it's one to one to one. And opposite to what I showed you in the case of Cushing disease, this adrenal gland is one to six or seven to one. And this means that this cortex is far thinner than it should be. This animal is hypo, exhibits hypoadrenal corticism, also known as Addison's disease. And because the adrenal cortex is where mineralocorticoids are produced, when these animals go into an Addisonian crisis, you see marked disruption of the electrolyte balance. And there's all sorts of numbers out there as to uh, uh, 
the sodium potassium ratio in Addisonian animals as high as 25 as low as 17 I'll I'll just shoot at 20 and if you see the sodium potassium ratio dip below 20 you are probably dealing with an, an animal with Addison's disease but don't be fooled there's a number of other conditions where you can see that because some things will raise sodium very high or or uh, raise I'm sorry, we'll drop the sodium or raise the potassium. A couple of things that you'll see is renal failure, where you have a decreased capacity to retain sodium. Or hemolysis, where you have a lot of extra potassium in blood, which is from lysing red blood cells. Other things that can do it is uroabdomen or whipworm infection or, or phosphofructokinase deficiencies, among many. So there are a lot of things that will mimic Addisonians from a ClinPath uh, point of view. The number one cause of this particular disease, hypoadrenocorticism, is the overuse of steroids. If a veterinarian is pumping steroids into an animal, you will see bilateral decrease in size of the cortex because in addition to mineralocorticoids, um, the cortex is also where glucocorticoids are produced. And if the body has lots of circulating exogenous glucocorticoids, there's no need for it to make it. So you will see a marked decrease in ACTH production by the pituitary and compensatory decrease in the cortex on both sides. Something that will cause a decrease on one side is if the other cortex has a large neoplasm in it, as we see here. We said that 80% of pituitary 80% of Cushing's disease is due to a pituitary tumor. This is your other 20%. A independently functional neoplasm, either adenoma or carcinoma of the adrenal cortex. Now, on the other side, we said that the cortex is going to be very small. It's sort of going to look like this because this particular tumor is producing a lot of cortisol on its own and the body is going to shut down ACTH production and you'll have a decrease in the cortex. Well, look at this, even in the same side, remember I said one to one to one, how about one to three to one? So this cortex is smaller than it should be. You're going to say to see the same clinical signs in these dogs that we saw previously with mineralization in the skin. You may see mineralization in other organs. Sometimes you see it in the lung, and mineralization of the alveolar wall renders that alveolus absolutely useless for any oxygen transport. It's one of the more severe sites for mineralization. Sometimes adenomas can be bilateral, and I don't want to forget about adrenocortical carcinomas. They tend to metastasize fairly widely. They can be difficult to, uh, to diagnose. They often have foci of, uh, of mineralization within them. They don't metastasize as widely, however, as thyroid tumors. They often tend to be um, sort of yellowish-orange because, remember, tissues that are yellow-orange tend to uh, be those that have a lot of fat. They're steroid making neoplasms. So yellow orange tumors that we see include uh, ovarian granulosa cell tumors, interstitial cell tumors of the testis, and tumors of the adrenal cortex. And you can always compare it with the adjacent cortex. When we look at tumors of the adrenal medulla, which are usually subclinical in the dog, um, they tend to be sort of a clear focus. They often have areas of hemorrhage within them. These are pheochromocytomas, and that's what we call these tumors if they are in the adrenal medulla or uh, for malignant pheochromocytomas if they metastasize, but you can find 
them in the adrenal medulla. Um, there are a lot of similar tumors in the disseminated neuroendocrine tissue of the body, and we usually call those neuroendocrine tumors or neuroendocrine carcinomas. Something else that you will see in dogs with pheochromocytomas are tumors in other organs of the body. About 50% of dogs with pheochromocytomas have other neoplasms. You may find uh, tumors in the thyroid, especially those of the C cells, or pituitary adenomas. And, and the constellation of these tumors falls into a category of neoplasia called multiple endocrine neoplasia. This is well worked out in people. We see it in other species, including rats especially, including cattle and to a lesser extent in horses. So these pheochromocytomas, they tend to be a little more bloody, they tend to be whitish, and the literature says that pheochromocytomas have, are much more likely to infiltrate into adjacent blood vessels, especially the vena cava. In my experience, I have seen just about as many of the adrenal cortical carcinomas infiltrate into adjacent blood vessels as the pheo. So I don't use that particular one for diagnosis. And that's why God made microscopes. So we can take sections of these, we can put them under the microscope and get a pretty quick diagnosis. Sometimes you get such poorly differentiated uh, adrenal cortical carcinomas that you will mistake them for pheos on a routine H&E. That is why I always like to run chromogranin and synaptophysin, which are going to light up the medullary tumors and pretty much leave the cortical tumors alone. Fortunately, there aren't really great widely available immunomarkers for adrenal cortex. So I always run the ones for the medulla because synaptophysin should make them light up. One other uh, lesion before we call it a day on endocrine, uh, pathology of the dog, and this is very, very common. It's these little nodules of cortical tissue that you will see outside of the capsule or within the capsule. They probably arise within the capsule, and they tend to grow outward. And these are little aggregates of cells that look just like those uh, in the zona glomerulosa. They are yellow. Um, intra or extra cortical uh, adrenal cortical hyperplasia is a very common finding in older dogs. We also see it in older horses and you will see it histologically. Don't misinterpret these as adrenal cortical tumors. Just a very common incidental finding. Well, that covers endocrine pathology. A lot of tumors of the endocrine system. Something else to bear in mind is that we often find incidental neoplasms uh, of the uh, endocrine system. Whether it's benign or malignant, when you're looking at tumors of the endocrine system across the board under the microscope, the cells tend to be very bland. There's not a lot of cellular features of malignancy even in malignant tumors. So you need to know a little bit about the clinical presentation, a lot about the gross presentation, and don't just say, ah, it looks bland to me, I'm gonna call it benign, or you're gonna be wrong a lot of the time. Endocrine tumors tend to be cytologically very bland. Okay, so we've covered uh, the endocrine system. We're gonna come back in uh, lecture number three and talk about the hematopoietic system of the dog. I hope you come back for that. And if you really like these endocrine diseases, I'm going to refer you to a, a group of lectures that I gave on the endocrine system of domestic species. We'll cover not just the dog, but the cat and all the other domestic species. Look for that on the Foundation's YouTube channel or the JPC's uh, video library. And I think you'll find those very interesting as well. So that's the end of today's lecture. I wish you all great health and a fantastic day.